Life's Third Act is a podcast dedicated to helping you get the most out of your retirement. Sponsored by Tucker Allen, attorney CPA Joe Cordell features guests each week to discuss prominent topics for those over 55. Here's attorney CPA Joe Cordell. Welcome to another episode of Life's Third Act. Uh, We're going to do something different today. Uh, I'm going to be flying solo. So um, that means that we might not have the sort of warmth and charm that others often bring to the to the screen with me. However, I do want to cover something that I think will have a lot of substance. It may seem a little intimidating to you, so let me let me bolster your confidence that it's possible to learn something. In this case, what, what a durable power of attorney is. It's possible to learn it, believe it or not, even if you're not a lawyer, to Go through the statute. I know many people don't do that, and I, I do agree it's very helpful. If you have a lawyer, go through it with you. I completely agree. Uh, as a matter of fact, I would argue that in some cases, depending on the statute, it's essential. But what I wanted to do today is teach you about this incredibly important tool, this powerful tool called a durable power of attorney. You've heard me talk about it a lot. I'm not selling something when I talk about this or advocating for business for Tucker Allen because this is a relatively inexpensive thing to do. I'm just so impressed that you can accomplish so much and a disaster can be so large in the absence of something so simple. You may not think it's so simple as we talk through it, but I will promise you this. If you bear with me through this, if you wade through this next, uh, what, 30, 45. Justin, we have, uh, what What are we gonna try to limit this to, 45 minutes? 45 tops, yep. Okay. So we'll see how far we get, but I'm going to walk through the statute with you, but I'm going to try to do it in a way to where this is not boring, and that's a challenge. So bear with me and see if I deliver on this. And incidentally, we may not get all the way through this. I mean, 45 minutes will get us through much of the statute, but whatever we get through today, I promise you, you will be impressed with how powerful and awed a little bit. You'll be awed because you'll think, wow, I've got to get this right. Not only is this a very important tool, but this is something that can go really badly wrong if I don't pay attention and do it correctly. That's the reason this is not a subject for a form, as some people, you know, solve legal problems is going online and ordering a form. This, as in almost all those cases, not all of them, but the vast majority of those cases, that's a bad idea. Strong roots are essential for a healthy tree, especially your family tree. That's why you work hard to take care of your family every day. At Tucker Allen, We know that taking care of your family means planning for the future. Our team provides personalized estate planning to help you protect your family, your legacy, and your future. From wills and trusts to long-term care and estate planning. Count on Tucker Allen. Personalized estate planning made simple. Let's start with the statute. We're talking about the Missouri statute. Those of you who are in other states, there's lots of resemblance among these. I'm going to first talk about and we'll show you this on the screen as we move through this. Um, I want to talk about a few definitions. I'm just going to cover the stuff that's important here because I know that there's a lot of dry stuff and and we just don't have time to get to all the things that might be of some interest to you, but we'll get to all the things that are of a great deal of interest to you or should be. Definition of attorney in fact. Um, so this simply saying, I want you to get used to this phrase, this is simply referring to the agent, the person that represents what we'll call the principle. So a durable power of attorney, the reason it's called durable is not because the paper holds up real well. It's because this is something that continues to exist even when you become incapacitated or incompetent. Historically, a power of attorney just immediately evaporated the moment that you became incompetent. That was just a, a standard fact of the law for reasons numerous reasons, many of which you can imagine. It's it's just a bad idea that you would sign something empowering somebody to act thinking that you're overseeing them and all of a sudden you become incapacitated. So powers of attorney historically expired. So the durable power of attorney is a, is a modification on the law. It's a big innovation when it came along decades ago, but it came along and, and it said, hey, there's a place in the legal system and in the needs of individuals for something that stays in effect even when you become incompetent. In other words, you have certain things that Matter of fact, things that specifically only want done for you when you're incapacitated. So it's the reverse of the assumptions underlying the power of attorney, and that's that you only want that person when you're communicating with them regularly, when you can check on them. This is commonly used 
at, certainly in estate planning, when it's the literal reverse of that scenario, you, you're not worried about when you're okay, you're worried about when you're not okay, and then you need somebody to act. So Durable Powers Attorney, uh, they have they have this this person, which you'll hear this phrase a lot as we walk through, is attorney in fact. This doesn't mean the attorney you hired. This is the person, the agent. It's your brother-in-law. It's your spouse. It's um, a representative at a bank or whatnot. So attorney in fact is just the agent acting for you under Durable Power of Attorney. The, the other thing is the durable power of attorney. Just a real quick, short definition you see here uh, for uh, Chapter 404, 703. Uh, durable power of attorney written, power of attorney in which the authority in the uh, attorney, in fact, does not terminate in the event the principal, that's you in this scenario, becomes disabled or incapacitated or in the event of later uncertainty as to whether the principal is alive or dead. In other words, that's something that happens, too, as people disappear. And perhaps they're eventually declared dead. Perhaps they eventually show up. But in the absence of someone, that qualifies as a circumstance normally when a power of attorney would expire. But this is a durable power. So just like if you become incom- incapacitated, then it continues to be effective. So um, enough for the definitions. I want to move to um, a f- few facts that I think you should know overlying what the scope of this power is. All acts done by an attorney in fact, pursuant to a durable power of attorney, shall inure to the benefit of and bind the principal and the principal success. All that means is anything they sign, any any relationship that they form, any contract or obligation that they undertake, when they're acting for you, assuming that that you have it has this scope of authority in the durable power of attorney, which is often very general then that binds you. It binds you as if you did it yourself. So it's a little bit of a scary thing, and you'll see this theme recurring as we walk through this. A person who is appointed an attorney, in fact, under a durable power of attorney, has no duty to exercise the authority conferred in the power of attorney. I included this provision as I sorted through the things I was going to call your attention to, just to let you know that when you appoint somebody as a power of attorney, they're not undertaking a duty like a trustee. If you if you appoint somebody a trustee, they have an affirmative duty to act on your behalf. They can't simply decide, oh, well, I think I'm going to take a month off and, and not attend to urgent business, for example, that, that might relate to your property or your interests. A trustee is bound by fiduciary duties to act. If they, if they undertake it, then they need permission of the court or all the beneficiaries in order to quit doing it. So this is not that. Now, it is a fiduciary duty, which we'll talk about in a few moments. I think we'll have time to get to that. But I'll tell you now, it is a fiduciary duty, but don't think of it as being exactly like a trustee because only when the the, the attorney, in fact, undertakes to act for you or to uh, the responsibilities associated with this document, only when they do something are, are those duties imposed? If they decide to blow it off entirely and to not accept this this role, then they can do that. They don't have the duty to act. That's all this is saying. But once they undertake acting as your power of attorney, then then they do have a lot of responsibilities, very serious responsibilities, thankfully, because I think you, you want that. I want to talk a little bit about the fact that people can often uh, and often do choose to appoint somebody who they may have some concerns about. Maybe that person is good in a particular area, but not in others. So division of labor is a wonderful thing when you're thinking about powers of attorney, because you can, and in many cases should, have more than one person simultaneously acting as your attorney in fact. So you might have somebody who's really good at caregiving for things that relate to personal decisions about your children, for example. If, if you die, you have young children or even adult children who you want to provide money under certain conditions, then the person who can read the scenario and circumstances better might be somebody who is more personal, who knows the kids, knows you, knows your values. On the other hand, when it comes to money management, you may think, well, gee, I'd like to have what's commonly called an institutional trustee. It just means... Um, an entity like a corporation. Maybe a corporate trustee is is more accurate. But it's somebody, it's a business where they're going to dot the I's and cross the T's. They give you a lot of confidence regarding things being done correctly. They're insured, which is huge. They have lawyers on staff to be sure that they, they get it right, whatever the rules are that you've set out in your document. Uh, so there's lots of reasons to have that person, but sometimes you lose the 
the interpersonal connection that exists when you have a family member. So it's not unusual to divide up roles. Now, there's no limit. As this, as this says, a principal may appoint multiple attorneys in fact. This is 404-707. So as a principal may appoint more than one attorney in fact in one or more powers of attorney. So you can actually divide the responsibilities in the power of attorney. That's kind of cool. So rather than simply having them stepping over each other, having the same turf to govern, so to speak, you can you can appoint them, you know, certain uh, areas of responsibility, spheres, and that's the, those are the things that they will do. If you want collective judgment, though, regarding particular ideas, then it may be a majority decision. I, I say this with caution because it does produce some logistical problems if you have people spread across the country. So it, it can slow things up. If you want a quick decision made, often those are the circumstances, at least early in uh, the triggering of a power of attorney. If you have a provision that says in the event I become incompetent, then it becomes valid rather than making it valid from the time you sign it. That's not unusual, incidentally. Both ways make sense. Uh, but the, the point is that scenario often involves a case where urgent things need to be done. And so think carefully about if you're going to have multiple people, are you going to give them spheres of responsibility or are you going to have overlapping judgment, uh, which has a certain appeal to it, uh, but understand the logistical challenges and the personal conflicts that can develop. So most attorneys will tell you it's often not a good idea. Um, I want to continue moving along and give you a sense of, of how broad these powers are. Uh, under 404.710, power of attorney uh, with general powers. So let's skip down to paragraph four. It starts out by saying, except as provided in, in subsection six and seven. We're going to talk about six and seven. Six and seven are the parts that you, uh, six is the part, the things, the topics, subjects that you cannot empower your attorney in fact with unless you do it specifically, meaning the law is saying, look, these are serious matters. If you're going to give them that authority, you need to specifically give it. And then as to seven, subsection seven, then you can't give it period. And you'll understand that when we get to it in a minute. Let's start out the, with the, the, the powers that the attorney, in fact, would have under a durable power of attorney. An attorney, in fact, with general powers has, with respect to the subjects or purposes for which the powers are conferred, all rights, power, and authority to act for the principal uh, that the principal would have with respect to his or her own person or property, including property jointly owned or by the entireties, that means husband and wife, uh, with the foregoing, has and with respect to the subject or purposes of the power, complete discretion uh, to, to make a decision for the principal to act or not to act, to consent or not to consent, to withdraw consent, for to uh, act, to execute and deliver or accept any deed, bill of sale, bill of lading, uh, some of these phrases I know you don't know, a contract, a note, a consent, receipt, release, proof of claim, I want you to get how broad this is. Remember what the law is saying, that anything you could do as a person who's not incapacitated and an adult, as a starting point, that's the authority this person has, except for the things that are carved out. That's the way the statute is written in Missouri and virtually every other state. So the general rule is that they have authority over everything relating to your financial legal matters, even health matters, if you choose to include that. And then the things you don't want them to have, though, you do have to indicate. You have to specifically exclude. And then there are some other things that are the opposite, that, that the, the law says these, the, the, this small handful of things that are critically important, this we're assuming the opposite they're not going to have. Now, part of these we'll let them have if you specifically say, I'm giving them the power to do this. And then there's another handful that, no, you can't give them that power, period. So start out with the idea that this person or persons will manage everything of value in your life regarding material things, legal things, property, interests, uh, contracts, et cetera, taxes. They're responsible for all of that to run for you. And you may be incapacitated during this period of time. Some of you may confer this power without being incapacitated. But for the most part, people who create a power of attorney intend that it to be triggered or the person to take the steering wheel when they become incapacitated. So 
Uh, one other provision to give you a scope. Uh, in addition, the attorney, in fact, has complete discretion to employ and compensate real estate agents, brokers, attorneys, accountants, sub-agents of all types to represent and act for the principal in any and all matters, including tax matters involving the United States government or any other government or taxing entity. Um, I just pulled out a, a section from this verbiage here that makes clear the scope of a durable power of attorney. Again, you can you can do a carve out, you can limit it, restrict it, to some extent expand it even. Uh, but if if you simply go with with the language that has been adopted by the state of Missouri without amending it at all, the 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 legislation, then that's going to give them the capacity pretty much to run your life for you. Number five, look at paragraph number five. An attorney, in fact, who has granted uh, general powers for all subjects and purposes or with respect to any expressed subjects or purposes shall exercise the powers conferred in accordance with your instructions, principal's instructions, and in your best interests and in good faith, prudently, and in accordance with these sections that it mentions, one of which we're going to talk about. So there is a duty on the part of the person who has this power to, as I suggested a while ago, to act in a very responsible way. It's a grave authority. It's a fiduciary authority. So lots of you know, bad consequences can flow to people who blow off their responsibilities as a fiduciary. It's a sacred duty in the West. So uh, number um, six, any power of attorney may grant a uh, power of authority to an attorney, in fact, to carry out any of the following actions if these actions are expressly authorized. So I mentioned to you that six and seven do a bit of a carve out well, six is that category of things that, that you can have this person have in addition to all those other things in your life. These things you've got to make specific reference to. And as we talk about it, you'll see why. To execute, amend, or revoke any trust instrument. You don't want to empower a person that you've entrusted in the event that you've become incompetent to be able to amend your trust, right? I mean, that's part of your plan for your estate for perhaps generations to come. So you probably want that to be protected rather than changed while you're in, incapacitated. What about to fund with the principal's assets any trust not created by you? So imagine the mischief there. Somebody creates a trust and then funds it with your assets. So not only in, in one, they cannot change or amend uh, or revoke any trust that you've already created, and they can't create a new one and kind of do through the back door what they can't do through the front. Uh, number three, to make or revoke a gift of the principal's property in trust or otherwise. So they can't give away your stuff, whether it's in a trust or not. Um, to disclaim a gift or a device, I really want to avoid going into that very much. Sometimes it makes a whole lot of sense that if you inherit something or something is given to you, there's something called um, a disclaimer and not in the way you've you probably heard the term used, but you can disclaim property and it's like you never received it for tax purposes. So sometimes entire fortunes are disclaimed for complicated tax reasons. So this person, if you give them uh, the, the attorney, in fact, the ability to disclaim something that is gifted to you or that would be an inheritance, then that's that will, can change forever a big part of your plan, and you want to think whether you want that done. That could change not only the funds that you have to live with, but also your children and grandchildren, depending on where that money would otherwise have gone. So um, if you want to give somebody that power, which sometimes people who are have very complicated tax situations, they may want to do that. So it's not always a bad idea. Otherwise, it'd be in paragraph seven. <laughs> but anyway, we're on paragraph six, where these are the things you can put in if you if you expressly say so. Number five, to create or change survivorship interests in the principal's property uh, or in property in which the principal has some ownership interest, some interest in the property. So I think you can see why this is probably not a good idea. You can give the person the authority, if you choose, expressly saying you want them to be able to change your life insurance beneficiary or the beneficiary on maybe a 401k or some tax um some, some employment-related benefit. Uh, that's something that most people don't want tampered with, and they don't want to empower somebody to act on their behalf to do that while they're incapacitated. Generally speaking, might it be a good idea? It might be. There are circumstances. 
Uh, but you really want to think about before you decide to give that authority because the law will enforce it. Let's go to item six. I'm going to skip a few of these. I don't think they're of interest to you. Number six, uh, to designate or change the designation of beneficiaries to receive any property benefit or contract right on your death. So this picks up anything else in which there's a beneficiary clause that would be triggered by your death. Uh, Same reasoning. To nominate a guardian or conservator for you. So a nomination is not an assurance that that person would be appointed because a conservator or a guardian is something that that's when the court gets involved. Remember, you're hoping that by having a durable power of attorney, you don't have a court involved. And that's the beauty of this thing is it goes into effect immediately. No judge is involved. I mean, it's a powerful, powerful thing that can save you tons of money and lots of valuable time. But there are occasions where there will be a guardian appointed, somebody who have authority over your physical care, for example, or sometimes there will still be a conservator report appointed. Um, It's up to whether somebody decides to go to court and do that. The good news is they don't have to for somebody that you trust to be in charge, but sometimes it does happen. And so when it does happen, then the the court is saying that that you're, unless you specifically say under the durable power of attorney that you want them to nominate the person, that means they'll file the action with the court, with the probate court, Yes, this is done in probate that you're appointed a guardian or a conservator. But if if they do that, they will file a petition in which they'll make a nomination. The nomination again has to be approved by the court, but you know, not unusually they are. So depending on if there are people who object, do you want to give them that authority to do that? Because that person could very well get nominated. Matter of fact, it might be the person with the durable power of attorney. So think about that before you give them that that level of influence. Um, to give consent to or to prohibit any type of health care. Normally, this is done through a separate document in the state of Missouri because it's a separate statute. It's a durable power of attorney for health care. Very similar. Durable power of attorney is what we're talking about here. There's this separate statutory provision that talks about a durable power of attorney for health care. Now, it turns out that you can, you can convert this into effectively that by putting in a provision that discusses your health care. So um, if you want to have that handled by the same person and in the same document, you can do that. I suggest you do that separately, that you do that through the Durable Power of Attorney for Healthcare because it's designed for that. Anyway, um, let's go to, uh, now that we're completing uh, subsection six. Now we're going to subsection seven. Now seven, these are the things that, you, you notice how the language starts out, no power of attorney, no power of attorney may delegate or grant power or authority to an attorney, in fact, to do or carry out any of the following actions for the principal. So number one, to make, publish, declare, amend, or revoke a will. I think we can agree that that's probably a good thing to have. So even if you don't like it, you can't give that authority. Um, to make, execute, modify, or revoke a living will declaration. Living will relates to your health care or um, whether or not you would be, uh, your life would be terminated or you would be on some artificial sustenance. What's the word I'm looking for, Justin? Oh, End of life decisions. But anyway, no, no, it's okay. Uh, sometimes uh, we have our sound guy act as our assistant lawyer to do legal research. And anyway, so to the extent, though, that you have something that relates to end-of-life decisions, then you're not going to empower this person to do that. You just can't do it. You can't give them the power to act through what's called a living will, to disconnect you in terms of artificial life support. Um, three, to require the principal against his or her will to take any action or to refrain from taking any action. Now, that's interesting. That assumes that, that you are competent and that you object to something. And in that case, you can never surrender your power to this person. Some people have a fear that, gee, if I give somebody present authority to act, I'm afraid that that I will become enslaved to their decisions. Well, it's possible that they can make a decision that you'd be stuck with, but they cannot force you to approve things or to do things that you don't want to do. Um, I hope that that explanation makes sense. Uh, then number four, to carry out any action specifically forbidden by the principal while not under disability or incapacity. Uh, that's an important statement. There may be things that you have said, perhaps in writing or elsewhere, that can be established in which there you feel strongly about something. And this was before you were incapacitated. Uh, those opinions, the court presumes, you would still hold if you were capable at that time to express them. 
So um, that's something that understandably would explode. You notice you notice that on seven there are only four items in that section. So uh, it's you know it's not very long. Uh, so there aren't many things that you're absolutely forbidden to include, uh, but they're important things. They're huge things. So keep in mind then what, if any, in the preceding, uh, actually subsection that you would have included, uh, those things are, some of them are good things to have, but they just have certain dangers that the legislature is essentially saying, look, if you're going to do this, we want you to, to expressly say so. We're not going to assume you intended this. Okay, so let's now move on to the uh, next subsection. Let, let's look at nine. Um, it says, it is the policy of this state that an attorney, in fact, acting under the provisions of the power of attorney, granting general powers, will be accorded the same rights and privileges with respect to the personal welfare, property, and business interests of the principal. So if the power of attorney enumerates some express uh, subjects or purposes with respect to those uh, subjects or purposes as well, as if the principal himself or herself were personally present and acting. That's how powerful this document is, is the idea that you're giving someone the ability to act as you effectively in the law. And the, and the law is trying to be very practical because they want they want this person to be unimpeded in their ability to go about and get things done for you. They're assuming that that's what this tool is going, is sought, why it is sought for the many people who have this in their planning is they want the person to be, you know, for the processes to be lubricated so they can get things done without fear of third parties thinking that they're going to be sued. And you'll see more of this later on. And and clearly the legislature had made clear to the, the person that's the attorney, in fact, as well as third parties that are doing business with you, et cetera, that they can safely do it without worry. But it does mean that there's some exposure. Uh, that's just the nature of this instrument. It's a powerful, powerful thing, but but you need to be careful as to, uh, as to the powers that you give and some of the checks and balances that, that are provided in a good, durable power of attorney that incorporates these various provisions. Again, some we've talked about, some we will talk about, but a number of which we just don't have time for. So um, let's see, section subsection 10, um, yeah, we'll skip that one. That just talks about the various things that companies can do if they want to to require that somebody who walks in the door with a durable power of attorney that they that they be able to have some confidence in it. But the bottom line is they're encouraged, businesses are encouraged to be uninhibited in accepting these and to being able to allow your attorney, in fact, to go about and do business for you. So um, duties of the attorney, in fact. So we're at 404-714. Uh, an attorney, in fact, who elects to act under the power of attorney is under a duty to act the best interest of the principal and to avoid conflicts of interest that impair the ability of the attorney, in fact, to act. A person who is appointed an attorney, in fact, under the power of attorney, uh, who undertakes to exercise the authority uh, conferred in the power of attorney, here's the language we talked about a while ago, has a fiduciary obligation to exercise the powers conferred in the best interest of the principal and to avoid, these are big words here, self-dealing and conflicts of interest. These are terms that carry up a, a lot of freight in the in litigation and whatnot. Self-dealing and conflicts of interest. I think you can imagine what those things are, but I bet that the law takes them further than even you might think. But the bottom line is that the court wants to be sure that this person is always doing the right thing. So they create a, a high bar. Uh, so self-dealing and conflicts of interest, as in the case of a trustee, with respect to a trustee's beneficiaries. We talked briefly about that. So it's similar to that in terms of the, the level of responsibility. Uh, the, the attorney, in fact, shall exercise a high degree of care in maintaining without modification any estate plan which the principal may have in place. That's good. So th this is what the law is saying that this person must do. Um, some of these things you can waive, some you cannot. Uh, on matters undertaken or to be undertaken on the principal's behalf, uh, to the extent reasonable po reasonably possible under the circumstances, uh, your attorney, in fact, has the duty to keep in regular contact with you, the principal, to communicate with you and to obtain and follow your instructions. This, of course, assumes that you are 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 not incompetent, 
that you have capacity, legal capacity. But in as long as they you can com- understand something at all, they have a duty to communicate with you. Um, that's of some assistance. That's what the law imposes. Uh, let's go down a few other paragraphs. Um, if following the execution of power of attorney, a principal is absent or becomes wholly or partially disabled, an attorney, in fact, exercising authority under power of attorney, uh, may consult with any person or persons previously designated by you for such purpose, and may also consult with others to obtain information, uh, for example, the, the principal spouse, physician, attorney, accountant, any member of the family, or other person, corporation, or government agency with respect to matters to help them fulfill their responsibilities. So you need to know that, that if you become incompetent, they have the ability to communicate with these people. If you don't want them to communicate with some of these people, most of these provisions that, I, that we've been talking about today and throughout the statute, they're, they're subject to your customization. You can change, you can add, cut, paste. There's lots of things you can do to make this very much the document you want it. I mentioned some exceptions a while ago, but for the most part, subject to those exceptions, you know, you can make this do what you want it to do. And some people may not want their their attorney, in fact, to have the discretion or authority to go to some other people. They may want to exclude particular people. So keep in mind, in the absence of that, this will be applicable to your durable power of attorney if it incorporates the language of the Missouri statute. Uh, five, if following ex- execution means signing of the durable power of attorney, a court appoints a legal representative for the principal, or the attorney, in fact, shall follow the instructions of the of this person that's appointed by the court. This could be a, a guardian ad litem. It could be a guardian. It could be a conservator. But sometimes, as I explained a while ago, that happens, though you hope that the durable power of attorney gets things done and you never have to have that done. Sometimes somebody may be concerned, for example, about whether the durable power of attorney, whether the attorney, in fact, is doing their job. They may suspect that maybe they're not properly accounting for your funds or keeping the funds properly segregated, et cetera. So it's, in a way, you should be glad that a person who's interested in you can bring an action in the probate court to have a determination if you're incompetent. Sometimes that will happen if you have a provision in your durable power of attorney that says, I only want this to go into effect when I'm incompetent. As obvious as that sounds that you would want such a thing, it it really, in a way, you could argue it doesn't make sense because if this is somebody that you trust, why that, that then why not trust them immediately? If it's somebody you don't trust, then why would you give them that authority for when you are helpless. So my thought is to avoid any hiccups in having somebody to to jump uh, jump into service for you and to do the things that you need to do. It's better to not create hurdles. And hurdles are a finding of whether or not you're incapacitated. So depending on the way that's worded, it could require something to be filed with the court. Now, if you have the proper lawyers, they're going to use different language. We know that we can have two or three physicians or even one physician certify that you're incompetent, that immediately gives, through that certification, gives that person authority to start acting for you, your attorney, in fact. But keep in mind, though, that, that you know, something can be filed to determine, to look at and determine whether the actions are appropriate of the principal, of the attorney, in fact, if you become incompetent. So um, then on the death of the principal, there is a duty that that the the person take care of your estate, you know, the, your agent, your, your attorney, in fact, has an obligation after your death to help you know, marshal your assets, to turn them over to whoever's the personal representative of your estate. They So you don't have to worry that, oh, this person has all this information and they know the status of things in your life and what happens when you die? Do they just disappear? No, their duty, in fact, continues long enough to get these things done. Um, so good news there. And I want to talk a little bit about obligations to third parties because um, you it's good for you to have your eyes open about potential liability when you have this person acting as you. Um, first, let, let's cover when when these are when uh, durable power of attorney becomes terminated. Usually that's not an issue. Usually it happens at death. But just so you know, you can have a, a date on your power of attorney 
by which you know it's excluded. Look at 404-717. We're going to first talk about the part dealing with termination, then we'll talk about the is some issues related to liability. So as to when one of these it terminates, one, on the date shown in the power of attorney, that makes sense, but I don't often see that. But you can put a date. Um, when the principal orally or in writing informs the attorney of fact, there needs to be some way to establish that, of course. But if there's been notice given to the attorney in fact, and that can be established, even if it were oral, then that at that point, they no longer have authority to act for you. We'll talk for a minute about what that'll mean with respect to third parties who didn't know that. Um, on the death of the principal, we already talked about that, subject to their assuring that your your assets and the state of your affairs are communicated to the personal representative. Um, on a written notice of modification or termination, which incidentally can be filed in the county in which you reside, it can be filed with the recorder of deeds, interestingly enough. So there are some things, certainly as to real estate, you can communicate things formally that way. Uh, but that would constitute a notification, sometimes to third parties, with limits, we'll talk about in a minute. And then on the filing of any action for divorce or annulment, uh, divorce or dissolution of the marriage, now this only applies whenever you have made your spouse the person that is your attorney in fact. That's commonly done. As a matter of fact, I would say more than 50% of the time that we've prepared those, it's been the spouse that was chosen, which makes sense. Who else are you going to trust better in the world? Unless this is somebody you get, you've gotten divorced from. <laughs> then it may be the person that you at least want in that role. So this, this automatically will void um, a durable power of attorney that's in effect in which you've named as your attorney, in fact, a, a what is now an ex-spouse. Um, now, let's talk about the issues of liability. As between the principal and any attorney, in fact, this makes a lot of sense. If the attorney, in fact, engages, we're on number five, um, if the attorney, in fact, engages in willful misconduct or fraud or acts with willful disregard for the purposes, terms, or conditions of the power of attorney, or if the power of attorney has been revoked or terminated and thereby causes damage or loss, uh, such attorney, in fact, or successor attorney, in fact, shall be liable to the principal or, you know, your heirs if you're gone uh, or, or both for such damages together with the reasonable attorney fees and punitive damages as allowed by the law. So, so the legislature is wanting to make clear that they know that there is potential for mischief for somebody who has this level of authority and, and what might in fact be very little, very few controls, checks and balances, like you often have for people in such cases. So they want to impose pretty stringent uh, penalties associated with behavior that, that could harm you financially or otherwise. Now, this doesn't talk about the criminal aspects, but th this is civil statute. But keep in mind, there are there is criminal law dealing with fraud. So to the extent that that there's mischief of that magnitude or culpability, then I can tell you that they're not just looking at these monetary damages, at civil damages. They're also looking at criminal, which I'm sure, depending on the amount of money involved, could be a felony and involve a long time in jail. So, so you, you do have some reason to feel confidence in the system that it's designed to encourage people to act in your behalf, in addition to the fact that you've selected these people, not a third party. This is somebody you've selected. Um, but I want to talk really about third parties, and I want this to make sense to you, and then we'll wrap up. Where are we here? 42 minutes? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to wrap up with this topic here. Um, the exemption of third parties from liability. This is uh, 404 719. Exemption of third parties from liability. A third party who is acting in good faith may rely and act on any power of attorney executed by the principal. And with respect to the subjects and purposes that are included in that power of attorney, may rely and act on the instructions of or otherwise contract and deal with the uh, principal's attorney in fact. Now, um, this says a whole lot, and then it goes on to say a whole lot more. Um, so there's a, after we say the principal's attorney in fact, uh, or successor, then go to in the absence of actual knowledge. So remember, this is a third party, say an owner of a store 
who sells a $10,000 item to the attorney, in fact, who pays for it with your money and, and from an account that is in your name, and they show them the durable power of attorney. Uh, in the absence of actual knowledge by this third party, it's a pretty low bar, actual knowledge, not, not he knew or should have known, he had to know. That's about as low a bar as the, the law offers in terms of letting people to have, have a wide berth for error. Um, is uh, in the absence of actual knowledge, is not responsible for determining and has no duty to inquire. Duty to inquire is a big phrase. I'll mention in a second. Not, no responsibility for determining and no duty to inquire as to any of the following. Now, before I go down that list, it's rare that the law says to somebody who's at, who is in a position where somebody could be out a lot of money that they have no duty to inquire. So there's a public policy behind what we're going over here that, that at a glance seems to provide very little protection and a whole lot of opportunity for mischief with durable powers of attorney. But the reality is the law courts and legislatures understand that this durable power of attorney is going to be pointless if you have third parties, whether it's banks, brokerage firms, you know, travel, travel uh, organizations, um, it can be retail stores, anybody that would contract with you regarding real estate, construction, any personal services contract, you go down the list. Think of all the things in your life that you interact with third parties. Well, if, if, it, if this were a minefield where it was easy to misstep, I can tell you that this durable power of attorney would be of little value because every time you took it to somebody, they would feel that, number one, they're not going to take it because there's too much risk involved, or they need to know a bunch of information, so much information that if you're the attorney, in fact, you're going to say, this is not worth it. I don't want to do this. Or you're going to be the principal and say, why would I have this? Because nothing can get done without a whole lot of legal hassle. So to keep the the wheels turning to to lubricate the process, then these laws have been enacted. So they definitely lubricate the process. So a this hypothetical merchant I was talking about has no duty to inquire as to whether this is a valid document, meaning to go and do something. They're allowed to look at the document. They can check and see if it's a certified document. They can look and see if it's signed or appears to be a signature, a name that's in cursive with uh, with, that is the name of the person who is giving the power of the principal. So they can do those things. But look at the things they are not responsible for determining and have no duty to inquire. Number one, regarding the authenticity of a certified true copy of a power of attorney. You know, I mean, it may be a copy. It may be a, a, a counterfeit document. No duty to check into the authenticity. Uh, the validity of the designation of the attorney, in fact. Maybe it's invalid for a number of reasons. They don't have any duty to look into the validity. Uh, whether the attorney, in fact, or successor is qualified to act as attorney, in fact. Um, number four, the propriety of any act of the attorney, in fact, or successor. Um, so, you know, is what they're doing, is it proper? Is it a breach of duty or obligation to the principal? Uh, they don't have a duty to inquire into any of that. Um, whether in any future event, a condition making this document effective or even terminating it has occurred. So, you know, maybe the document's only valid when you're incompetent, but in this case, the merchant doesn't know if in fact you're incompetent, but we have somebody in front of them who's the agent who's saying, I want to go ahead and go forward with this transaction. I have authority. So there's no duty to inquire on the part of the merchant. Maybe there's a date, well, if there's a date on it at which authority expires, they're responsible for what appears on the face of the document. So I don't want to overstate my case. If you have a, if you have a document where it says that, that this expires in such and such date, so be it. That, then you're protected. But what about the far more probable situation where it relates to incapacity as being whether they have authority or not, I mean, your incapacity, or whether you're dead or alive? We know this is not valid after your death. So... Among these things are whether the principal is disabled or incapacitated. That's number six. Um, number nine, whether the uh, authority of the attorney, in fact, has been terminated. 
maybe the authority has been terminated by one of those means I mentioned, but in fairness, the merchant doesn't know. They don't have a duty to check the court records. So the merchant's going to go forward in this case without actual knowledge, and they did not have a duty to inquire. I mean, that's pretty scary, isn't it? Um, and you're still respond. My, my point is you're responsible as a result of, of this protection of merchants. It means that the merchant collects from you. You become obligated. You may have a cause of action against the person that you've appointed or your estate can, may bring an action seeking reimbursement. That's fine. But what this is saying is that merchant is protected. That merchant gets their money from you if nobody else, and they don't have to wait and sue. They don't have to bring an action against a third party. They're entitled to the money to collect directly from you. You are directly obligated to pay this merchant in this scenario. So think of all the many contracts and all of the many transactions that can be undertaken with no duty to res- to inquire on the part of these, you know, this myriad of of third parties from all walks of life and regarding assets, property, services, etc. So number 11, whether the principal had legal capacity to execute the the power of attorney. In other words, I mean that could be a problem. You know, normally that would make this thing invalid, right? It is invalid except with respect to a third party who wouldn't have known. Um, whether at the time that the principal executed the power of attorney, the principal was subject to duress, undue influence, fraud. I mean, you know, how often that happens in documents of this nature relating to, to someone's health or their care or their estate planning. So often there is some family influence or other influence involved. No responsibility for anybody doing business with somebody walking around with this piece of paper to inquire into that. I mean, th- this is not an exhaustive list. This is, it, it makes clear the statute does. This is just some examples of things to reassure. The purpose of this, of this section is to reassure merchants and other third parties. Look, don't worry about this. You can do business with, with these. You're protected. As long as you don't have actual knowledge, do, sign contracts, sell things, purchase things. You know, you're protected. And remember, the purpose, it has a, it has a positive um, side of this discussion and even an important public policy consideration. And that's that if you don't give this sort of protection, I'm being devil's advocate here a little bit, um, but if you don't give a lot of protection to these merchants and other third parties, then why have a durable power of attorney? Because it's just going to get gummed up in the, in the, the legal process where you know, lawyers become involved and there have to be investigations and, and certifications, et cetera. So this is an effort to allow this thing to really get stuff done for you. But there are some risks. There are some risks. Um, number 15, the truth or validity of any facts or statements made in an affidavit of the attorney, in fact. So even the attorney, in fact, might provide an affidavit that the person, for example, is incompetent and that that triggered the, 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 the power being, uh, uh, the authority being exercised. Again, that's not always true, but if you write it up that way, that it's not valid until you become incompetent, then maybe your attorney, in fact, creates an affidavit in which they, you know, they, they state that you're incompetent. They sign it, get it certified. I mean, they, there's no duty on the part of the merchant to investigate the validity of any of these things. Um, uh, whether the principal is alive, that's number 13. Uh, so I think you get it. You get it. I want you to to appreciate how incredibly useful and powerful these are, but that with that comes a significant amount of risk. So you you need to think about you know the person that you choose. Uh, you need to think about whether or not you want them bonded, which is possible, but more that's unusual, to be honest with you. It's more about picking the right person and maybe bolstering that with having a corporate trustee in addition. You can see where corporate trustees do seem to offer relative safety from some of the things that, that we've discussed or imagined, imagined here. Um, but a corporate trustee is not for everybody. You do have to pay more for that. Um, I, there's also a provision here we didn't have time to get to regarding payment. Of, of the person that you appoint uh, to be your durable power of attorney or your attorney, in fact, rather. And, and many people don't put a provision for that, but I can tell you that you really should because it is a lot of work. And, and um, depending on who it is, it might be your son or daughter, and they wouldn't think of 
being compensated. I get that. I understand that. But depending on who it is, you might you might consider that. So often that's neglected, and, and it can be a significant amount of responsibility. So son or daughter, maybe they do it. They should, you know, they're they're the beneficiaries. I'm sure of your estate, but uh, but other people, you know, think about whether you want to make a provision for that. I can tell you that the corporate, tr- uh, the people who act as corporate trustees or corporate holders of durable powers of attorney, I can tell you that they they are compensated. and They insist on that in that role. But having said all this, we covered a lot of territory. We didn't go too far over, uh, but we'll wrap up here. We can pick this subject up in the future, but I hope that, that I delivered on my promise that you'd know a whole lot more about durable powers of attorney if you, uh, if you waded through this with me. This has been another episode of Life's Third Act. Till next time, take care. You've been listening to Life's Third Act, a podcast for thriving in retirement. Sponsored by Tucker Allen, your estate and elder law advisors. Each week we discuss topics and answer questions to help you better plan for your future. For more information, visit TuckerAllen.com. Subscribe and listen again next week for another edition of Life's Third Act. The choice of a lawyer is an important decision and should not be based solely on advertisements.